We are in, <coughs> excuse me, week four of our Bible series. The last one. Some of you, hurrah, some of you, no, let's keep going. So week four of taking a look at the Bible. All right, quite honestly, in the last four weeks, how many of you have taken this off the shelf? Well, look at that, about a third of us. Well, good, excellent. And the rest of you, it's okay, no shame, no blame, no guilt at Unity Northwest. And you still have an opportunity to do that. Because I was thinking about what it is that we're really looking for or what we might really find in this book. As my coming to the last of this, I thought even more about what else can I say about it? How can I really kind of, you know, put the exclamation point on this one so that when you walk away from this series, you say, now that's the thing I really remember. And here it is. The most important thing, I believe, that you're going to find in this book is you. The most important thing that you can find in this book, if you want to play with it and you want to look at it a little bit, is it's a story about you. We like to say that this is a book about consciousness. Consciousness raising. And of course, as we said in the first week, it's not just one book, is it? How many books is it? 66 total. We got the old, the new. Now, do we call it the Old Testament, the New Testament anymore? No. What do we call it? Not Nancy. What do we call it? <laughs> and the you got it. Who was that? Was that Gail? There we go. Thank you. Janice. That was Janice. All right. Hebrew scriptures, Christian scriptures. So a little bit of reminders of some of the things that we've covered over the last three weeks to say, oh, this isn't exactly what I thought it was. And it probably isn't the book that I was taught about. Because most of what we got came from others. Which is the benefit of you actually picking it up and doing something with it. Now, I know that is a little scary at times. What do I do with this? Nancy Leahy has taught us that we can just Bible dip, just pop it open, point, and see what jumps out at you. People have told me over the last couple of weeks amazing things that have happened. Like exactly what they were thinking about, the passage popped up for them. Other times, no. But that is one way to jump in, is to just Bible dip. You can be part of a Bible study group. You can do all sorts of things, and I'm going to offer you the way that we were taught in seminary using the Socratic method. <laughs> oh my gosh, right? Things just got really heavy and intellectual and what? Now, maybe there are some teachers in here who've heard that term before. Anyone familiar with the Socratic method? Of course, now you're going to have to explain it. Would you like to stand? Okay, one, I saw another couple of hands back here. Marty is familiar with it. So it's a method that you're using all the time. You just didn't know that that was the name of it. The Socratic method is basically three steps. You start where you are. You go on a journey and you explore. And then you come to a new decision. You do that all the time. I'm looking for a refrigerator right now. I start with the refrigerator that I have, I go online and I Google and I do some research, and now I have a new refrigerator. You do that with your ideas all the time. Every time the news comes on, anytime you read anything in a magazine, it's starting to automatically put you into the Socratic method. Like, oh, I'm learning something new. Is this changing what I believe? And that absolutely happens when we dig into the Bible. So you start with even just a premise about the Bible itself. Forget a passage, just the Bible itself. Each one of you is here. And think about three weeks ago, you were probably in a different place with the Bible. Hopefully something I've said has shaken something up and you think a little differently. Know something that you didn't know before. Like, hey, there's 66 books in there. 
I thought it was one. I listened to a sermon. Now I know there's 66. Do you see? You just did that. I see, I tricked you. I put it in the method and you didn't know it. So you think what you think about the Bible right now. And maybe even by the end of this sermon, you'll listen to this sermon and then you'll think, you know, I got something more out of it. Like, it's my book. Who knew that it was my book? I thought that this was other people's books, that, that they knew about it and they told me what it meant and I didn't agree with that, so that's not my book. Wait a minute, nobody gets to tell me what it means and what I should do with it and what it really says. Because if there was one thing that it was really saying, we would have all figured that out and agree on it. Clearly that's not the case after 2,000 years. We're all going to see it differently and disagree and agree on certain things. So what do I think? I have the power. Don't we always teach you that here? Oh, hello. No thanks. Guess you forgot to put her watch on um, airplane mode. Okay. So back to the Bible. Think about what you think traditionally about it, how you grew up with it, and if you had any doubts or questions. You know, for instance, Gee, I don't like how it treats women. Many of us feel that way. How many of you have felt that at times? Like, gee, I really don't like this story about women. Wow, only about a third of us. No, I'm kidding, because I know you're just like, oh, she's asking me to raise my hand again. <laughs> I know probably most of us are. And then you do some research. Well, why is it that way? Or the killings, right? We don't like that it's so violent, the book. And then when you look at it, you realize, well, actually, this is a book that's telling us about history at times, about how difficult life can be and how we can overcome it. Well, then there's going to be difficulty. So there should be stories that are uncomfortable in the Bible, and then the stories about how you overcome, like Job, a very discouraging story. And you think, I don't want that in my life. I don't want to read a story about that. But in reading the story about it, you read about that human struggle and you learn. Then you can look at the treatment of women and you say, well, when you understand the state of women at the time this book was written, it all makes sense. Of course they didn't have stories with women as the hero because that wasn't done at that time. It doesn't make it right, but now I understand it. And maybe what I can take from that is, what are the stories about women? Can I dig them out? Can I read about Deborah? Can I talk about Sarah instead of Abraham? Can I bring some of that out and make it my book? That's the power that we have to go through what you start with, which is a thesis. You have a thesis about a Bible passage. Then you go through the antithesis. Well, maybe not. Let me look at it. Let me research it. Then you put that all together into a synthesis. So let's do that, shall we? Let me show you what it looks like with a passage that I bet everybody knows. Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. Everybody know the mustard seed? You've probably heard it many times. So this is the passage that is about the mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed, now we're back to the seed, which indeed is smaller than all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in its branches. That's the mustard seed passage. It's a grain of mustard seed, which is the kingdom of heaven. And he took it and he sowed it, and the seed is smaller than all the other seeds, and it grows into a big tree, and then the birds come and sit in it. Pause and think about what does that do for you? What comes to mind for you when you hear that on any level? Huh? Like when I first, yeah, Gail, yeah, go ahead. Louder? Abundance. abundance. Excellent. So she thinks of abundance. Great. Anybody else? 
We have roof, Dallas. Sanctuary. sanctuary. Building a sanctuary. Tree, okay, roof. Well, a seed can be a thought. Ah, oh, she's cheating. She's jumping ahead. <laughs> a seed can be a thought. Great. Anybody else? Here are some things that I thought about. First, I thought about what do I know about mustard seeds? I don't actually, I don't know if I've ever even seen one. Have you? Okay, some of you gardeners have seen them. Yeah, so I mean, and really, aren't all seeds small? Yeah, so, you know, if this one is particularly the mustard seed, but okay, yeah, a tiny seed, an acorn grows into a tree. Oh, a tree, interesting. I wonder what the birds mean. And then I think, oh, I remember hearing that Jesus taught a lot to farmers. So he was always using agricultural references because they would understand them. We can understand them, but not in the way that the people that lived in that region at that time understand them. So my antithesis was, I want to go look up mustard seed. I got interested in mustard seed. So I went and I learned that there are different mustard seeds. And what grows in that region and what grows in our region is different. So just right there, I realized I'm not totally understanding this passage. I can't understand it in the way that they did, that there are nuances. And then I saw pictures of what looks like trees, American mustard seeds. And then over here looks like a willow tree bush. It's just a floppy bush. It's basically a shrub. So isn't that interesting to me? Oh. Maybe it's not really a tree. I wonder what word was originally used in, in Greek when it was written down and what word he used in Aramaic and what he was really trying to say. Because he didn't write it down. The writer of Matthew wrote it down. Probably not Matthew, but some people wrote it down. So, okay, I don't have to take it so literally. I'm not actually sure what this thing looks like because there's a difference between a tree and a floppy, shrubby bush. And that's just one word. Okay? So enough on the mustard seed, enough on the tree and on the bush. But I look a little bit farther and I say, well, I wonder what other people say about it. So that's an example of humility when reading the Bible. To say, I know what this means and I've got any part of it figured out. You might say, well, when you dig into this word and that word, it starts to change. So here's from a website called Steps of Faith. He went ahead and interpreted it for me. So it's fun sometimes to go see, well, what are other people saying that it means? The meaning here is that if the kingdom of heaven is like an enormous plant with room enough for entire flocks of birds, then heaven has enough room for God's children. It's okay. Eh, it was okay with that. Anybody else? Eh. So I'm not sure. Is this a place in the sky that has rooms? I'm not sure. But okay. So this one was focused on this is actually a parable about how heaven is going to work and who gets in and, and who gets out. All right. Then here's another one from Ellicott's interpretation. This is about the Son of Man. It's about Jesus. The Son of Man, the church, is smaller than any sect or party in Palestine or Greece at that time. And it grew until it became greater than any sect, any school, any religion. A tree among the trees of the forest, a kingdom among kingdoms. Oh, so Jesus was actually saying, my church is going to go grow bigger than every other church and then every other church will want to come to my church. Mm, Marnie, mm, not sure I'm liking that one as much. But there you have it. See, if you think that everything that Jesus is saying is about building the religion of Christianity, which didn't exist, right, when he was alive, but okay, so he's talking about, I want to grow this biggest church ever. Now there's another way that we can look at it. And Ruth gave us, thank you, an idea to start with. You can look at every passage in the Bible as about raising 
consciousness? What if it's, we just set aside whether he was trying to tell us he is the best church in the world, or how many people get into and out of heaven, and we say, well, can I learn anything, apply it to my life today? If everything is about consciousness, and metaphysically, I could go look up some things. And I did that. That's part of my antithesis. I'm like, well, what do these words mean spiritually? And uh, Again, what was the meaning of mustard seed? I could do that with all of that. So here's what I came up with. As I swapped out words, which you can do, you know, the metaphysical Bible dictionary says, you know, that the kingdom of heaven is basically talking about your consciousness a higher state of consciousness. So, what is a higher state of consciousness? So I swap out the kingdom of heaven, and I say, a happy, healthy consciousness is like a tiny, fleeting thought thing. It's like a tiny, fleeting thought, the mustard seed, which we hold in mind, we plant the seed, which is planting it here, and we repeat it, and we sow and water it in our mind. We keep it in mind. And it may seem weaker than all the other thoughts. Remember that this tree, this smallest seed, grows beyond herbs and everything into a tree. So it may seem like the smallest. But when it's a powerful, positive idea, it grows exponentially more than all the other random ideas that I have. So it may seem weaker than negative thoughts, but over time, it overcomes every type of thought. It's the highest form of thought, prayer. It overcomes and it becomes our foundation. It becomes a tree, something strong and solid, and it can't be missed. It's so tall and so high that every other idea, birds that are flying, every other idea will come that is what that passage ends up meaning for me. The strength of my spiritual teachings. And when I can take a tiny positive seed, when I don't feel well, or I feel down or negative, that wants to win. But if I can grab one little tiny positive thought, the light of God surrounds me is one of my favorites. I automatically go there, the light of God surrounds me. It's a mantra, the light of God surrounds me. If I can grab a hold of that, it's like planting a mustard seed. And it will, all together, all told, build it so that I am strong enough and centered enough so that things can come and go and they will filter through my tree. I will see them with a higher consciousness and it will change and bring heaven here on earth. doesn't always work or it doesn't work fast but in time a positive mindset makes a difference I was just reading a book this week called Happy it was written in 2010 just jumped off the shelf at me and it was some of the earlier writings on positive psychology which of course aligns with what we do here and over and over again he referenced study after study about how one small shift in a change of your thinking or getting out of something that's not working is powerful. And that's what's in that passage, just for you. Somebody else can tell you it's about something else, and then you can take it, and you can read it, and you can see what comes out of it, that you get to decide. And so I'd like to read one more passage to you and let you let it sink in and become what it needs to for you. Very simple. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Let that sink in. Come to me, whatever the divine is for you, come to that when you are weary and burdened, when it's been a rough day, when there is something nagging at you, when you have someone you're concerned about. 
bring it to the divine and I will give you rest. That's in there too. That is a comforting thought. And whether you believe in a God, divine being, if you start to look at it from a spiritual perspective and bring whatever burdens you to whatever uplifts you, to positive thinking, to Jesus, to our teachings, bring it to that. Let it sit in that tree and let it transform. My favorite, probably like a lot of you, is the 23rd Psalm. So even though there are difficult parts in the Bible that we talked about in the second week, and even though there are people that are telling us what this book means and what you must believe about it for you to be part of the tribe. I say no. Charles Fillmore and Myrtle Fillmore all those years ago said we see deeper teachings in here and we're going to try to decode it for you so that you can then work with it. He says in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary that nothing that he says is final. It continues to grow. So even when it tells you in that book or in the revealing word what something means, maybe there's a new way to look at it too. You can essentially write your own metaphysical Bible dictionary according to Cindy, according to Linda, according to Rika. We all get to decide. So listen to the 23rd Psalm as well. I just have to give you that one. And if you know it, you can say it along. I'm doing the King James Version. Ah, oh, because it's just so darn pretty. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thou art with me. Thou art with me, and thou art in this book. It turns out after a life of loving and hating and loving and hating and back and forth that when I'm simply quiet and I look to those passages that are meant to inspire us, I do find comfort. And I hope that you can too. And if you can't, it is okay. I say this over and over again whenever I address the Bible. Ultimately, you decide. No guilt here if you are at a place like I was at times and may get there again to say, Ugh, just not working for me. Because there's great stuff out there too. I am not limited to this book. I think that's fabulous. That's one of the things I love about this place is we get to still keep growing and learning and trying other things. And everything that we teach and use here is aligned with this, but it may appeal to somebody in a different way. And that's what we're doing starting next week with the four agreements. Don't take anything personally. Be impeccable with your word. All of that is in here, too. So if that's working for you, that is great. Because let me tell you, I spent a lot of years not having much to do with the Bible, doing all sorts of unity reading, all sorts of growth reading, and that was fantastic. And then this is part of it too. So you decide. You get to decide. Eric Butterworth, you have the power within you to decide. Pick it up, dust it off, take a dip, see what you think. Maybe today is the day 
where you say, I'm gonna do that. Or maybe today is the day you say, don't you tell me what to do. <laughs> I'm doing just fine. Gotcha. Enjoy. Either way, namaste. <laughs>